So for both jobs, um, there are a lot of high, bar, hard, high barriers to success. And, and, and it's, in most cases, even hard to get in. For agents, it's a lot of money. We talked about that, just kind of coming in. For scouts, it's mostly time and connections. How are you going to find someone that's going to champion you, that's going to help you become what you want to become, that's going to get you in the right doors and keep you there? Because it's all about knowing people. Both are vital jobs. And, and here's another thing. Um, I spent the last six months, six months ago, I had an agent who's been a friend for a long time call me. This was about a month before free agent started. And he had a player that's getting ready to get a second deal. And he got a phone call one day from a player and said, hey man, you're out, I'm gonna sign this bigger firm. And he was so frustrated because he'd always been a guy that kind of worked with smaller players and kind of raised them up. And then he'd wait trying to get into the second deal and a big firm would come in and steal the player. And so he said, Neil, I'm done with this business. I'm tired of backing out of my driveway to get on a plane. My kids are sitting in the driveway crying because I'm leaving again. And the player that I'm going to help couldn't care less about me. He said, okay, Dave, no problem. I'll find someone to buy your firm. So I put something on out on the Friday wrap and I got a phone call the next week from this guy, an agent based in Atlanta. He said, hey man, I really want to meet someone, that guy that wants to sell the firm. And so we got them together and things looked great. But the difficulty of selling an agency is you're really only selling your, number one, when you sign a player, all that money comes into you. It's almost like you have a personal services contract with them. You don't have an infrastructure. You don't have managers or secretaries or whatever. You don't have a hard brick and mortar building. You just have you and your own ability to, sc to scout a guy, sign him, do all those kind of things. So that was one obstacle. And then it's funny, as Dave went through and things got better for him, and he started signing better players, and he got a guy to a second deal, he wasn't as interested in signing anymore, or in selling anymore, because he was starting to have that success. And that's kind of what the agent business is like. You're always on a super high high or super low low. And it takes emotional toll on guys. And now we're at a point where the, the AC, he's probably not gonna sell it because he's had some good things happen. He's got all this ammunition, so to speak, contacts and networks and knowing how to recruit and all those kind of things. And he doesn't really want to sell them anymore. He knows that they, don't, they aren't really marketable per se because they only work for him. Scouting the same way. All these scouts that I have that, that work for me, they spend all their lives being either coaches or evaluators. That doesn't translate to selling insurance or selling cars or whatever, the, the usual kind of grown up jobs that most people do. You become an expert at finding players and identifying guys that may not be a guy now, but they will be someday. And then one day, a team comes in and says, sorry, we don't need you anymore. There isn't an obvious place you can go to use those skills that you spent 10, 20 years practicing. So you need to know going in. If you're gonna try to be one of those things, you wanna pursue that, that's how, if the end comes, it's sometimes it's hard to translate that to another field. Like most, and I've touched on this already a little bit, like most jobs, they seem glamorous. They're not always as sexy as they seem to be. Let me tell you something, just about agents, as an aside. Everyone thinks, and I'm gonna become an agent, I'm gonna be tight with these players, they're gonna be my best friend. That's not the case at all. Most players do not have close relationships with their agents for a number of reasons. They see them as business managers for them and primarily guys that need to be selling their skills. Um, an agent is most usually thinking, well, I'm gonna go and negotiate the contract. That's great. But that only happens every three, four, five years. The rest of the time, players' perception is they need to be going out and find them off the field deals. Well, because of the way football operates, only a handful of players on the team are really marketable for endorsement opportunities and that kind of thing. Because everyone's wearing a helmet, they're not as visible as a baseball player or a basketball player. So finding those marketing deals is hard, but every player expects the player, uh, an agent to do that. And that's not really their game, so to speak. So it becomes a difficult situation because you don't become as close with the player maybe as you thought you were gonna be. Very often you're kind of a whipping boy for the player. They see you as someone who's never justifying the amount of money that the player's paying. Even though you might have covered their training costs, gave them a signing bonus, gave them per diem or anything like that. Memories tend to be kind of short. Okay. 
So what are the fields? Oops. So what are the, the things that are happening right now that no one has really monetized, or at least they're still kind of figuring out how to monetize? Coaching representation, I think, is the next frontier for most agents that are kind of getting fed up with players for a number of reasons. Number one, no one, there is no licensing body to represent coaches. Any one of y'all can go represent a coach right now if you want to. All you gotta do is go to the coach and say, hey man, I know how to negotiate, I've got a network, I've got friends, I'm gonna go to the wall for you, I'll make sure I take care of you. That's it. There's no one like the NFL Players Association that's gonna say, okay, you gotta pass this test, you gotta pay this fee, you gotta have this insurance, nothing like that. Anyone can do it. Now, that's the good news. The bad news is, Everyone's trying to represent coaches, and it's hard to find the ones that are really going to climb the ladder. So many times you're seeing guys that have been 10, 20 years kind of moving up incrementally, meeting people, what have you, and they never make it. Whereas a guy like uh, the new Bengals coach, Zach uh, Taylor. What was his last Zach Taylor, 35 Zach years Taylor. old. Almost played in my first All Star game that I ever went. That's how old I am. Zach Taylor is the head coach of the Bengals, and I think he's been an NFL coach less than five years, maybe three years. Position coach, two years. Position coach, two years. Now he's the head coach of the NFL team. One of 32 people. Why? Because he got on the right staff at the right time. And he's got the Sean McVay halo on him. And, and his father-in-law. Ramon, Mike Sherman. Ramon could talk a, a long time about how people are in the right place at the right time to be coaches and that kind of stuff. Anyway, coaching representation can't, is something that no one has really figured it out. No one has really said, okay, here's, here's how it works. Here's how I find the coaches. But, and again, the big firms, if you're a coach that's going to be a Zach Taylor who's on the right staff and maybe has the right pedigree and knows an offense inside out or a defense or something like that, during the summer, if you've got a week, they're going to take you to Vegas, man. They're going to show you a great time. They're going to bring in all the search firm guys, which we'll talk about in a minute. They're going to introduce you all the search firm guys. They're going to have ex-GMs come in and tell you about how to handle the media and how to put a staff together and how to do all these things. And, man, they're going to make you feel like, you're bionic, man. You're ready to be a head coach. They're going to spend whatever they want to. They're going to wind them down you. They're going to make sure that you're never going to fire them and you're going to be an apostle for them if, in, if another hot coach comes and asks. So it's hard for smaller firms to, to offer those services, to meet that barrier. And that's why, and that's another reason why coach representation is still kind of a wide open Dodge City kind of thing. Now, search firms is something I'm kind of learning about as well, but every school, big school that really cares about its football team, they're going to hire a search firm. They're going to hire a third party to come in and find the coach for them. Um, this year, the combine, we had our first ever coaching seminar. We only allowed 10 agents to come in. They paid a pretty high number. We brought in the head of the top search firm, based in Chicago. We brought in Doug Whaley, who runs the XFL, and we brought in a top writer. And they all talked about coaches and that kind of thing. It was incredible for me because I got to hear the search firm guy talk about how, basically, no school gets a head coach unless we say, we tell the school who they're gonna hire. The, co the school doesn't come back and say, what about this guy? It's all preordained. And another thing this guy talked about, he said, we're gonna, we will call the school and tell them that we're interviewing the coach when he's on a plane to go take the next job. So there's no, oh hey, you know, this is all nice, we're gonna be real collegial, we're gonna help people out. And it's bloodthirsty. It's, it's dog eat dog. And these search firms have a lot of power right now. And right now they're hiring head coaches, they're starting to get into coordinators a little bit. It's starting to get, it's starting to go down. And if you are a hot coach, you need to be learning who these search firms are and who they, what they're looking for and all those kind of things because they are the true kingmakers when it comes to college football. Analytics, everyone's probably seen Moneyball or at least heard of it. Analytics work a lot better in baseball and, and even to some degree in basketball than they do in football. No one's really figured out how to develop an analytic for offensive line play. No one's really developed, I mean, even if you've got analytics on a quarterback, at the end of the day, someone's making a turn in which that was a good throw or a bad throw or whatever. So that's still something that's kind of growing, and a lot of people don't really have answers on where it's going to go and how it's headed and all those. I work with a company called Sports Info Solutions. They are the, one of the biggest, if not the biggest, baseball analytics company. Almost all the baseball teams subscribe to them. Almost none of the NFL teams do because they've all got an in-house guy that does analytics and they don't really know what to ask the guy to do anyway. So it's still a very flexible field and it's something that intrigues you. I encourage you to pursue that. 
All right, so I think there are a few lessons to be learned if you want to try to break away and do your own thing, which is what I do. Let me tell you how ITL got started and how it kind of got to where I was. So I moved to Houston in 1997, and I knew nobody except my parents who were living in Houston. Um, so I got, so I took a job with Houston Chronicle. Working at a job was, which was like the, the biggest dead end job of all time, all right? But it got me to Houston, so I get in here, and within two weeks, I met this girl at my workplace, and I was telling her about you know, how I love football, all that kind of stuff. She said, oh, really, you should be my fiance. He wants to be the next Mel Piper Jr. So I thought, okay. Nobody even knows who Mel Piper Jr. is now, right? And he's kind of, nobody really, he's not even a big name anymore. But anyway, he was the guy, first guy to use all the buzzwords to talk about the draft, and, and he got to fight with an NFL GM one time, one year, and all this kind of stuff, really cool. So. Troy and I decided we're going to put out this print product and we're going to do all these draft prospects and we're going to talk about who's going to be hot, who's not. Now it's going to be 1997. Well, in 1997, the web is like this. Print, print paper stuff like this, okay? So for five years, essentially, we took turns spending about $2,500, $3,000 publishing a draft guide that we went up stacked up in our garage. So, but I started going to all-star games and I started meeting people I started learning kind of about who was behind the scenes in football. And so I think around 2000, 2001 is when a magazine called Street and Smith Sports Business Journal was launched. And that's when the idea of sports business news was a thing. That's when real money was becoming a big deal and stadiums were being built and all that kind of stuff. And so people started to think, okay, business and sports, they're not like this, they're kind of like this. So I thought, well, all these sports business news Football only, every day on the web. So we launched in 02, and I did all this, I did all this market research, and I sent out this questionnaire, and I thought it was so smart. And I, we had all these agents and all this stuff, and I thought, man, I'm gonna be rich, I'm afraid my server's gonna crash, we're gonna launch Memorial Day weekend in 2002, all right? So we launched, and we got, and at midnight, I, even, I stayed up to midnight, because I was afraid that when this day starts, I don't want, and I don't want anything to fall, you know, so I'm gonna be ready to, you know, to, Prove people and stuff. We got one, we got three subscribers in the first week, and after like three days, two of them wanted to cancel. So I was like, okay, then maybe this isn't quite what I thought. So kind of failure in ITO 1.0. So we toddled along for three or four years, kind of making some adjustments and having some successes, but not a lot. And I helped run my first All Star game in Houston in, 0, in 07, called the Energy Youth North South All Star Classic. Didn't have a good experience there, so I got hired to run. Go ahead. I'm in. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Perfect. So I got hired to run the Hula Bowl um, in 08. In 07, I got hired for the 2008 thing. Um, thought I was going to retire from there. I thought I was going to, you know, be running around a grass skirt all the time. I thought all things were going to be awesome. Um, true story, guys. Was owned by a con man, a literal con man. I could go into all kinds of details, I'd love to, about what all happened, uh, but since we're filming this, I can't because I signed an NDA um, kind of thing with them to get some of my money back. Anyway, came back to Houston in, uh, that's all I can say. Came back to Houston in January of 2008, didn't know what I was gonna do, I had shuttered ITO. I was really frustrated with my lot in life, and my wife kind of said, hey listen, idiots, instead of charging half, $45 for nine months, why don't you charge 25 bucks a month for inside the league and really do what you said you were gonna do. I had been kind of being half for fans and half for the business. She said, go all off the business. Forget about the fans. Okay, let's try. So we relaunched in September of 08 and the people that had subscribed to me and were getting 45 bucks for essentially a year were calling me and saying, you idiot, how, how, who are you? How can you do this? You're crazy. And then by January, they were subscribed because no one else was doing what I was doing. And that was the key. I had found something that no one else was doing, and I was willing to fill that niche. And so that was 08. We, we had a really great growth year that first year. We had an even better growth year the year after. We've been growing by about 10% most years ever since. This is all I do. Um, I'm not going to get rich, and I'm not going to get famous, but I can support my family and build a network and help a lot of people by doing this only because it was something that I found that turned out to be something nobody else was doing. 